Okay, it is 8.05, so I am officially going to welcome you all today for coming to the first webinar of the first ever National Bun Society um, No Show Button Show. So we had to adapt a little bit because of this pandemic, so we're very excited you're here. Um, my name is Jean Peterson, and I am the social media coordinator for MBS, so I'm the one that's been sending you all the emails and signing you up and everything. And I've been super honored to organize this event and use technology to bring us together during this time of uncertainty. At the end of this webinar, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, I see that a lot of you have already found the Q&A um, section at the bottom of the screen. So just make sure throughout the presentation, if you wanna um, ask a question, that you can do so. Um, if, you, if you type them out, then Barb will go through at the end of the webinar and she will answer the questions that are relevant. You know, she hasn't already answered throughout, things like that. Um, I'm going to introduce Lou Yergin because she is our soon-to-be president, um, and she is going to be introducing today's speaker. I hope you enjoy the webinar and we continue to support NBS. All right, Lou. Okay, as first vice president, I have the privilege of introducing our speakers during the No Show Show NBS convention. We appreciate Barbara and Matthew for volunteering to give their virtual programs through the Zoom internet. We are all learning about this new way. Barbara Weeks has given so much to our button collecting community. She's a member of our local button club and we can depend on her for creativity as well as knowledge when members have button questions. Barbara has collected buttons for 26 years and loves sharing her collection of vintage clothing display at shows. She served as Missouri State Button Society's president, was a member of the National Button Society board, is assistant to the judging chair for MBS, and currently serves as president of the Midwest Regional Button Society. We are in for a real treat. Here is Barbara Weeks and her program on a beginner's guide to aluminum. Go Barb. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Jean, first of all, for uh, helping us through this process. And thank you, Lou, as well, for introducing us and for all that you do for the National Button Society. Um, this is kind of my first experience uh, with Zoom, so I hope everything goes smoothly. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see how it is. Um, I'm gonna start by saying I was initially asked by the Illinois State Button Society uh, to provide a program for the show this year, which unfortunately we weren't able to hold in person. Um, and when they asked me if I would present a program, I thought, okay, well, what can I do it on? And I said, well, I've done a couple of smaller programs on aluminum for state clubs. So that's something I could kind of work on and expand a little bit and do on the national level. But I want to preface all of that by saying I am in no way an expert in any particular material field. Uh, it's just a particular subject that I enjoy because I have a lot of aluminum buttons and, um, and it's also just fun to study and see what's out there. So uh, I'm going to start the, uh, my little screen share here so we can start looking at some of my slides and we're going to go through some of these buttons. Um, and as Jean said, we'll have some questions and answers at the end, but hopefully I'll answer any questions we have as we go through. And so you won't even need to ask any. So um, let's get started. Uh, let's see. Okay, and uh, I also want to say too that if you're, uh, if you need to, um, the little right hand corner box, if you need to move it out of the way to see more of the buttons that are on the slides, you should be able to kind of drag and drop that up to the top right corner. All right, so let's talk about aluminum buttons. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about history, although I don't want to spend a great deal of time on that. I really kind of want to get more to the buttons, but it is a little bit important to knowing how many buttons we, older buttons we have, especially division one. Uh, so aluminum is a metal that is, is extracted from a particular type of ore. And the first scientist to be able to extract this and create a pure metal from it was a Danish chemist named Hans Christian Orsted. And so that was in 1825. Um, and then you had a variety of chemists who were sort of experimenting with it to try to figure out a way they could do it because it was a very 
very difficult to do, so they could only get very, very small amounts of it. And as such, it was considered to be quite expensive. Um, at one point in time, it was actually more expensive than gold. Uh, it is said that Napoleon actually had a, Napoleon III had a special set of cutlery. It was made from aluminum that was only used for his most important guests. So then in 1886, you had a couple of different scientists who independently developed a way to do it through an inexpensive, inexpensive electrolysis process uh, that made it a little more um, affordable or a little more practical to be able to use it. So as you can see from the chart on the left side here, you can see where in 1885 you had world production of aluminum and it started very low obviously, but then as they developed better ways to extract the aluminum from the ore, um, then production skyrocketed. Uh, it was very much novelty, it's very bright, beautiful metal, so you had things sort of coming on the market as this became more available. And then you can also see in this little, little chart to the right, even by year, how in 1853 it was as much as 550 a pound, but by 1895 it was down to 54 cents a pound. Nowadays we would price it by the ton. Uh, a little interesting bit of uh, trivia is that the um, capstone for the Washington Monument was actually made out of a solid piece of cast aluminum. At the time, that was the largest piece of cast aluminum uh, that had been made. And at the time, it was also the Washington Monument was all, also the tallest building. Also, I wanted to show you too, this is just a little item I have at home. This is a salt and pepper shaker from the World's Fair in 1904. Um, it's engraved on the front and it's very, very lightweight. In fact, if I put it on the counter and crushed it with my hand, it would just crush down to nothing. Um, but at the time, that was kind of a, a interesting sort of object to have. Now, the way I'm gonna talk about buttons and how to identify aluminum buttons is, is that I'm going to do it more by comparison. So we're going to look at a variety of other metals and even plastic and look for sort of tips or pointers that you can use to determine whether or not the button you have is aluminum or some other, some other metal. Uh, so we're gonna look at some things that might commonly be mistaken for that or are very similar or have similar characteristics. And we're gonna start with silver. So the most important thing to know about aluminum, aluminum is a very bright metal. On the scale from black to white, it's, it's up closer to white. It's very bright, it's very reflective of light, and this is actually why they use it uh, as backing for mirrors, uh, as well as silver. So silver, the thing about that is that silver, uh, while it's bright and shiny when it's first produced in the case of this particular button, this is a hallmarked silver button from around 1904. What happens over time is that silver, even silver plated buttons will develop a tarnish. So they will start to turn kind of black or gray. Uh, you can, of course, remove that tarnish very easily with a polishing cloth, but inevitably it's going to build up that oxidized tarnish on the surface. But aluminum, so here we have a Division I aluminum button um, that has some cut steels and just a little bit of a tint in it. This is a Division I button, so it's quite old, but it is still as bright as probably the day it was born, the day it was made. <laughs> Okay, now we're gonna look at aluminum versus pewter. Um, so pewter is mostly tin, which is a bright metal as well, but it's mixed with other, other metals as an alloy to make it harder and more usable. And some pewter buttons, these are division one buttons, meaning pre-1918, so these are 19th century. As you, these are bright cut pewter buttons, which have got a tint on the surface, and then they've been kind of cut down into there. And as they do that, it makes the, the pewter shine. It has very bright points that sort of catch the light, and it's because of the tin content that's in them. But we're gonna do a little comparison here. So here we have a Division I uh, pewter ball, and it has been sort of lacquered or tinted, and then it's been, they've cut down inside there, and you see the little bright points there. But here is an aluminum division three, meaning post-1918 button. So this is a more modern button, 
And this one has also got a baked on painted coating and they've cut down inside there so you can see the bright points in there. But if you compare the bright areas in the division one pewter versus the division three aluminum, you will see that the pewter has more of a gray cast to it. It's not that clarity of the whiteness that the aluminum is. And another more important way to tell the difference is this. Uh, pewter will be much heavier than aluminum. Aluminum is exceptionally light. And when you pick up an aluminum button, um, they're usually almost light as air, with some exceptions that we'll look at later, but they are quite a bit lighter than pewter and brighter. Next, we'll look at uh, tin zinc. So uh, the tin zinc buttons were made mostly in the 19th century. So again, division one buttons. And you can see that when they were first produced, it's sort of a stamped design you see on these mostly, and they're almost always crimped over a, a back. And when they're first produced, they're pretty bright. You can see on the bird over here, the tint in the background, but on the high points, you can see it's pretty bright because it just has not seen much wear. And again, that's the tint on there. Same with the woman. Uh, you can still see her detail is still pretty bright. But what happens with tin zinc is that tin coating wears off very easily. So what you're left with on this butterfly is a very worn button and it looks very gray and very dull. Um, and once that's gone, it's not coming back. There's no way to polish it and bring that back to life. But once you kind of familiarize yourself with those buttons, you'll know how to tell the difference. Over here, we have a division one and quite rare um, aluminum button. It's actually considered a pearl button for classification purposes because it is a pearl background. But in looking at the metal that's covering the surface here, outside of the areas where you've got the tinted lacquer, uh, the places where it's been sort of carved and cut, you can see that that is very bright and very white. And you could, if this button was worn, the only thing that would wear off would be the tint or the lacquer, that aluminum would still be nice and bright. But again, considered a pearl background for competition, but still a good example to show you the brightness of the aluminum. Okay, next we have aluminum versus silvered brass. The button you'll see here, again, is a pearl background, so not technically a metal button, it's classed as pearl. If you were to hold this in your hand, you would say to yourself, well, this is rather bright. This is magnified quite a bit. But if you were holding it in your hand, you would say, wow, this is really bright. I wonder if this top is aluminum. But if you look at the outer edges, you can see where it's sort of worn down to the brass underneath. So you see that sort of hint of yellow in the high points and on the outer edge. The next button though, there you can see an aluminum example. Again, it has the pearl background, but this instead has a, has a aluminum uh, surface on it. And interestingly enough, uh, it almost seems to, they almost seem to imitate each other. The uh, left button almost is like a cheap imitation of the real aluminum and pearl button that you see there in the center. And you can see that it's got a lot of really pretty clarity. There's no hint of yellow outside of the tint that you see in the center of the flower. Now, a very common type of Division I button that you will find in a lot of poke boxes are these uh, chased brass buttons. They're small buttons. They're usually about a half an inch or so. Um, and they're really quite pretty, very affordable, easy to collect. If you're looking, you can also find the silvered brass versions of the same brass button. So sometimes they had a silvered coating. Um, if you were comparing these two side by side, you might say to yourself, oh, well, this brighter, lighter one must be aluminum. But again, if you look very closely, you can still see the yellow underneath uh, that coating on the surface. Soldering or a brazed on shank, you will not find this type of a shank on an aluminum button. They could not braze on or solder on uh, shanks onto aluminum, and it has to do with a certain oxide layer that builds up when the aluminum is produced. So they're just not able, to, for whatever reason, to be able to attach that through that process. So if you see a shank that has been brazed or soldered on, you should know that that is probably not an aluminum button. 
Okay, let's look at some other uh, yellow metals. Now we're in sort of a division three category here, which is post 1918. Both of the buttons that you see here, both of these fan buttons were made by the JHB company. Um, very similar in shape and size, color, um, kind of look identical, but one of these is aluminum and one of these is a straight up yellow metal. Here you go. So what you see here is the backs of the buttons. The top button is the aluminum button. Here you see that very typical kind of wedge shank with the hole in it. That's a very typical type of button for aluminum. Now it does not mean that you can't find the sim a similar type of wedge shank on another type of metal, but for the more um, modern late 20th century aluminum buttons, this is a very common type of shank that you would see. On the bottom here, you have a sort of a brazed on half loop shank. And so very easily, once you flip these over, you can see which one is the aluminum and which is the uh, straight up yellow metal. Now the thing is, there's sort of an anodized finish that goes on a lot of aluminum. Um, and that's how they get that yellow on that button. So what I'm gonna, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a, a little bit later, but the, another way to know would be to do sort of a little scratch test. So here you can see a very close up of the shot of that wedge shank. And what I did was I basically, I just took a very sharp little tool like a pin or something of that nature and I just sort of scratched in an inconspicuous spot through that gold and there you can see that sort of uh, silvery aluminum color that's underneath that anodized finish. Okay so this button um, we're going to look at synthetic polymers and aluminum. The button you see here is actually currently being sold on eBay as, a, as an engraved aluminum button, um, but it is actually very definitely synthetic polymer, and you can tell pretty much when you feel it in your hand. And I'll show you, here's an aluminum button, okay, roughly probably about the same size or so. The Way to tell a difference between plastic and aluminum a little bit has to do with um, the temperature. So aluminum is, is highly conductive, has a high thermal conductivity. So if you take an aluminum button and you sort of hold it to your cheek, or if you take a plastic button and you hold it to your cheek, the aluminum is going to feel colder. If it's been sitting at room temperature, it's going to feel cold, whereas the synthetic polymer is, is not. It's going to be at room temperature. Another thing you can do is look at how hard is it. So if I were to take the plastic button and if I were to tap it on my teeth or tap it on a glass, um, it's gonna have a different kind of sound, a different kind of feel. So the plastic, if I tap it on the glass, it's gonna have kind of a clunk. But if I take the aluminum button and if I tap it on the same glass, it's gonna have more of a clink. So it's going to have a different kind of sound to it and it's just a different, harder feel to it. Another thing to look at is the shanks. So um, your metalized plastics or ABS plastics, um, they have a slightly different type of shank for the most part. Here you see kind of some hourglass shaped shanks. And if you look here, on the back of this top right one, there's a little bit of a line. It's kind of hard to pick up with my camera, but sometimes the metalized plastic or ABS plastics will have a mold line that goes along the back and even along the top of the shank. Here we have the backs of a couple of aluminum buttons. So if you come down here and look here, let's see, we'll look at this one first. Here we have a nice little wedge shank that's cast with the button. The edge here, the edge of the aluminum button is going to be sharper than, say, the edge of the metalized plastic button. The metalized plastic is probably going to have a smoother, softer feel to it. The aluminum button could very well have a, a sharper, sharper edge to it. Not always, but in general, it'll be a little sharper. And then on the right example here, uh, you can see that basket weave kind of pattern on the back. And that's uh, a kind of a typical type of um, design that you'll see on the back of some of the uh, 
late 20th century aluminum buttons. It, again, it also just tends to be a little thinner and sharper towards the edge. So that's how you tell the difference between the plastic and the aluminum. Okay, now we're gonna look at steel versus aluminum. Here you have essentially two identical buttons, okay? These are vintage trouser buttons and they look identical. Um, so how do I know which one's aluminum and how do I know which one is steel? Simple, magnets. So you can see that the button on the left is not gonna attract to a magnet, that one is your aluminum button. The button on the right, magnet's gonna stick right to it, that's your steel button. Another way to tell, oh, and here, just some more examples of some other uh, trouser buttons and pant buttons that you can find in aluminum. That You could probably do a lovely little collection just of those. So another thing to look for is rust. So if you come over here to the bottom left button, you can see there's a whole patch of rust on the upper left part of that button. That is a steel button. But if you come over here, you're going to see an aluminum button. This is never going to rust. So no rust, no magnet, no magnets, no rust. I also want to show you, this is an interesting button. I, I was actually sent this button by a uh, picture of this button by two different people, and both of them are constructed the same. You'll recall I told you that the buttons can, the loop shanks cannot be soldered or brazed onto aluminum buttons. So the manufacturers of aluminum buttons and makers of aluminum buttons are always trying to find creative ways to uh, make their shanks or at least attach their shanks to the buttons. And in this case, there is a sort of a tab. It's all sort of one piece. There's a thick loop here with a little tab. And if you look over here, it goes all the way into a slot in the button. And in both of the examples I've seen, they both have a little cutout space where that has been fed through that slot to create the button. And probably the cutting and the chasing might have been done after the fact, but I find that a very interesting way to uh, create a shank so that it could be usable. Okay, now we're just gonna look at some different ways that the aluminum buttons are decorated or made. Um, these are all chased examples. Um, these again are the earlier division one buttons. They're all small except for the top right button, which is a diminutive button. And I can tell you right now, diminutive buttons in aluminum are very hard to find. So if you're a collector of diminutive buttons and you get a hold of an aluminum one, then you've got a little treasure. Um, and outside of the top left button, which has sort of a, a hint of a yellow tint to it, for the most part, what you're going to see is a total sort of lack of color outside of maybe a little dirt or something of that. They're all going to have be very clear, no hint of yellow. Um, and with chasing, basically, they use tools that, that they punch on there and it just sort of moves, moves the metal around. It doesn't remove the metal, it just sort of moves it around and creates these interesting designs. And there are lots of tools that they would use to do that. Uh, the Scoville company was, was especially good at that. Um, here on the right, you can see there's a set of three that have the same design on the front. And here's what, you should, what I wanted to point out, which is the back of the button is actually steel. So that's what the shank is inserted into, is into that steel back. So if I were to take a magnet to this button, I'd say, oh, I think it's aluminum, but let me check it with the magnet. Well, the magnet is going to st stick to this button because it has the steel back. So in this case, you're just going to kind of look at the back and look at the clarity of the white metal on there, and then you'll be able to determine that. And as you can see on the diminutive button, sometimes they used uh, a brass, put it over a brass back as well. Okay, now hammered aluminum buttons are an especially attractive uh, type of button to have. The way it works is this. So hammered aluminum was very popular from like the late 1920s up to the 50s. Um, and it was popular for making a lot of aluminum uh, objects that housewives enjoyed, percolators, um, trays, bowls, things of that nature. And you had forges around the United States that were producing them and they were making beautiful designs. And the way they would do this is they would have a master engraver who would engrave the die that they were going to use in steel. So there would be a steel die that was engraved then they would put the piece of aluminum over this, and then they would literally take a hammer and they would just whack on the back of that item. And in doing that, you're basically forcing that aluminum, which is a very soft metal, 
into that die, and then you, when you flip it over, then you can see the design that would be on the front. Uh, I do want to point out one thing while I'm on this slide, and that is the right button. I've told you already that aluminum does not really tarnish, and it does not rust. What can happen is sometimes it can build up a little whitish sort of film. Uh, there's sort of an oxidation process that can occur if it's poorly stored. So every now and then you'll find just a little bit of a white film, um, maybe on one of your buttons. This particular button had that little bit of a white film on it. Um, I was able to clean it off and polish it by using a jeweler's a rouge with a buffing wheel, um, and then it, it just brought it right back to life. It's got a lovely shine to it. Um, although I just want to say to be very careful with cleaning aluminum. In general, aluminum does not need to be cleaned much. And obviously, if you do get it wet at all, you want to dry it off thoroughly. But uh, if you do that, you're really kind of risk, risking removing any kind of a tent or getting underneath a crease in the back. So it's better not to clean it with anything other than maybe a dry brush or something of that nature. Okay, so here's a, a hammered aluminum button you see on the left, that great pattern, and it has the back mark on the bottom here, which is H. Pomerantz out of New York. Um, and that the H stands for Herman, and he had a little company in New York where he produced um, jewelry and accessories and other goods, but obviously buttons were kind of part of the line as well as the belt that you see here. Um, and I wanted to show the belt, which I actually found in an antique mall and I was actually just thrilled to find it. But if you look at the belt, I'm gonna show you up here, look at the top right and you can see the marks that the hammer made when they were hammering that piece of aluminum into the die. So when I'm talking about hammered aluminum, this is what I mean. You're seeing where the hammer was used to beat that thing down into the die and then of course when they were done then you could flip it over and you could see the lovely design that they had created on the front sort of an embossing thing um you can actually find the same button in brooches as well if you look online you can see there are brooches with glass on it uh, pomerantz did not make specifically just aluminum products they also worked with brass and some other metals as well So most of the hammered aluminum buttons that we would find are going to be roughly from the 30s, 40s, that era, sort of between the war. Um, but this is a group of buttons that was more recently produced in 1994. Uh, these were made at the Wendell August Forge, which is in Pennsylvania. Uh, one of the button clubs in the state of Pennsylvania uh, had these buttons produced and they were sold as a fundraiser during the 1994 National Button Society show. They were not the official favor button, but they were used as a fundraiser. Uh, the three ones on the three flowers on the bottom were sold, I believe, within the state as a fundraiser from within their state. Um, but what's interesting about these buttons, aside from the fact that they're actually just beautiful, so they're hammered aluminum, um, which then, of course, the edge would have been cut off. But you can see right here, there's a little two initials, which is a D and a B. And that is the name of the master engraver who worked at that time at Wendell August Forge, which was Dave Brock. Uh, now, again, I've told you before that it's very hard to attach uh, a shank to aluminum, but sometimes you will find a shank that has been glued on and that's what the folks in the Pennsylvania Club did. They actually took some existing shanks and glued them on the backs of the buttons. All right, let's look at some other hand tool techniques. Um, over here we have some buttons that were created. This is sort of the same style uh, as you would find maybe in a Native American silver with the with the use the dies and the punches to create the designs. Um, the one top left, the sort of squarish one, uh, was produced at Church of the Holy Spirit, according to one of the National Button articles. Um, I don't recall, I think it was back sometime in the 1940s. And here we have a studio button. It was, this one was made by Shirley Burgess. Um, these buttons are hand tooled again and she does not use any molds or anything of that nature this is all done by hand she draws it out and then she uses various tools and punches to create the design and then it's uh, mounted over a steel back so if you use a magnet 
Again, it's going to stick because of the steel, but that is an aluminum front and it's got a, t a lovely little tint added to it to sort of highlight the design. Um, and it's important, I will note here for, for competition purposes, any sort of two-piece construction button like this where the top is stretched over the back, the front material is the material that it is. So this is aluminum button. And if you haven't seen already, National Button Society sent out an email, I believe it was yesterday, uh, that, that uh, allows you to purchase the no show, show button set, favor button set from this year. And those were made by Shirley Burgess. Next, we have uh, another studio button. This one was produced by Kevin Kenny. And here you can see where he hand cut the edges. You can see where it's beveled and sort of sharp on the edges. And here he probably used like some little, little jeweler dies and a little hammer to put those letters on there. This one, I'm not sure of the age. Um, it was given to me as a gift and it's really lovely. It's got a fish that's been incised on the surface and it does show some signs of being hammered. Um, the person who, who gave it to me indicated that the one she has is marked on the back V Smith, um, although I was not able to find out who that is. So if somebody out here knows who produced that button, um, I would love to know. Here we have a beautiful machine tool button. This one was uh, produced for the Florida State Button Society. It was one of their show buttons quite recently within the past few years. Um, it's got a lot of detail and it's got a great shape. It's a very thick, very sturdy, very large button. So it's kind of heavy. And here we have a button. Um, that looks as though it was probably made from a rod of aluminum on a lathe. It looks like maybe they put the rod on a lathe. You can see the lines on the back here where it was probably uh, caught on that lathe. Um, and then it's got the peg shank with a little drilled hole here. Um, and then of course it's got the Star of David which has been cut into the surface. Um, this one, I, again, I don't know who the maker is, but it's marked WH Chase, uh, dated 1963. So if somebody knows who produced that or has more information about that, I would love to know that as well. Okay, now we're getting into sand cast buttons. And these are some really fun, beautiful buttons um, that were produced by Joseph Utsi. So Joseph Utsi was producing buttons uh, back from 1956 to 1970, and he was making them using a sand cast technique where he creates a mold using hard compressed sand. Uh, first he makes you know, a facsimile and then he creates that sand mold and then he pours the molten aluminum in there. And then once it's um, cooled off, then he can pull it out and then he can finish off the edges and smooth it out. Um, but whereas I told you before that aluminum buttons are just sort of light as air, these are gonna have a little more weight to them, okay? Because they're, they're solid and they're cast. Um, the detail is not usually very sharp on these because they're sand cast, they're a little softer. Um, but he made a set of uh, presidents, and then you can see the Joan of Arc. The bison has some additional metallic paint that was added to it. The head at the bottom, I'm not sure, it could be William Shakespeare, I couldn't say for sure. But what you're looking for in order to find one of Joseph Utsi's buttons is you're looking for the back mark on the back. And I've got two examples here, and you can see there's a, there's a J, an F, and an E, and it's in the little circle, a little raised circle. Um, and then it's got a self shank cast in there with it. I did read that some of the earlier examples had a wire shank that was embedded, um, but the ones I have seen have mostly been this thick, sturdy uh, wedge shank that's cast with the button itself. And I'm gonna show you a couple more examples. Here we go. The left button uh, is the Mayflower and it's quite large, but not nearly as large as my favorite button on the right, which you see the Madonna there with the added, um, gold metallic paint and in person it's quite large and it's a very lovely button. Okay now we're going to talk about probably one of my favorite types here is the French cast buttons. Um, these kind of have the same look and feel as those Joseph Utsi, Utsi <laughs> sand cast buttons. So these were made in France uh, roughly we think about the 1940s. Um, and there wasn't a lot written about them specifically until recently. Uh, if you have Loic Alio's uh, newest book, which is A Button Odyssey, um, 
he has one page uh, which in indicates that he thinks he's found the likely origin of the buttons, which was a foundry in Ga called Gaio Crest, um, which is a foundry where they did sand casting in bronze, brass, as well as aluminum. So he thinks that's probably the origin of the buttons and probably around the 1940s. Um, but again, these are going to be heavier than the other aluminum buttons that I'm showing you because they're much thicker and they're sturdier. Um, I especially like the top right button because I kind of feel like it could be a biblical story. Um, I, I couldn't say with any certainty, but it, it looks like it could be a biblical story going on there. But here is the back of that same button and you can see um, where that gold anodized finished is sort of wearing off around the edges and you see that big thick shank. And here's some more um, less common over here you see the crown. The crown is actually pierced or open work so you don't find this particular type of button as often in an open work style although they obviously do exist. You can see sometimes they added a decorative paint finish on the surface as well. Most of the ones I have seen are not marked, but I have found, if you can see down here on the bottom right, you can see where it says Made in France has been stamped in the back. So occasionally you will find a marked one, but not, not often. And again, a lot of these have that yellow anodized finish on them. Here's a few more. Uh, the top left button is a centaur and it shows the wear. So, so these buttons, the detail is not real crisp again because of the way they're cast and it shows some wear, but they still have a lot of charm, I think. Uh, those kind of clunky, chunky kind of plastics and ceramic buttons that were coming out of France around mid-century, that's what I sort of think of when I see these. Um, then you have a beautiful lady's face, which, which is in just great condition, the pu poodle, and then the, um, looks like a faucet, faucet handle, rather. Okay, now we're gonna talk about some probably more plainish looking buttons. Um, here we have ones that were produced by the, the patent button company had a patent for these. You can see here where the patent was applied for. And then here you can see the back marks in 1924 where they actually um, had that on the back of the button. And these were produced, were at the time were supposed to be an improvement on vegetable ivory, china, things that could easily crack or break. Here we have an original sales card that shows some from the patent button company and the variety of colors of that baked on paint finish. And on the right side, you'll see some cast aluminum buttons. And what I like about this card is it says hammer proof on it. And uh, yeah, I like to know why they're taking hammers to their buttons, but who knows. Here we have a sales card from Atlas Tack, who's making buttons around the same time period. These have a finish on it that, as it turns out, they were using a ground up fish scale solution, adding to their paint, and so they could come up with this beautiful sort of uh, jewel tone finish you'll see there on the bottom left. But then you can see on the right how easily that would wear off, and you can see what that same kind of button looks like once that finish has worn off. Not so great. Now we have the aluminum stencils. Um, these are kind of fun to collect because you can probably put together a whole tray of these buttons. Uh, although you might have to repeat the patterns because there wasn't that many patterns, but you could certainly come up with a variety of colors. Um, so this, these were patented by the Patent Button Company and that goes back to 1930, as you can see. So they had the patents on the designs and you can see some of the colors there. Here's a sales card from a different company, um, and you can see sort of the range of colors and some of the same styles. What I wanna point out here is over on the right side towards the bottom, when they produced these, they sort of marketed them in, as being a better alternative to China stencils of the same type, um, that they were gonna be more durable, but as you can see that baked on paint finish just didn't hold on well over use in time and flaked off, so. Uh, here on the left side, you can see some of the examples where they had a darker color paint that went on first, and then they would stencil over that, over stencil that with, uh, in this case, gold. And on this slide, bottom right, you can see where they did it with silver instead. So that's a silver color paint finish on that one. And then this is an original sales card from Atlas Tech. As it turns out, both companies, Patent Button Company and Atlas Tech, were pro both producing buttons around the same time uh, with the same designs. 
Um, but early on, members of the National Button Society went and interviewed each of the companies. And when they were asked about the fact that they were both producing some of these similar design buttons and same design buttons, uh, neither company really had a, a, an answer for why they were the same. So probably, probably patent button company didn't think it was worth their while to go after somebody and protect their patent. Again, these are aluminum stencil buttons, but these are uh, a less common patterns. The one on the left, I would describe as sort of an off-center target. And the ones on the right, they're sort of like two almond shapes at the top and bottom. And here you have two different body styles. This one is more of like a little dog bone style arrangement there with the holes. And this one is a uh, more like a fisheye. But you can see over here on the left, on this black and cream one, you can see where, how easily that baked on paint and lacquer finish just chipped right off. So it's really kind of hard to find them in good shape. Now I'm going to talk about that anodized finish that I mentioned earlier. So it's sort of an electrochemical process that, they, that creates an oxidized sort of finish on these buttons um, that hardens them. It's going to make them more resistant to corrosion or things of that nature. And at the same time, they can add dyes or metallic salts that add color. Um, and if any of you Remember back in the 1950s, they had these, these really fun aluminum, anodized aluminum cups, drinking cups. And I remember them because my mother had a, my grandmother had a set and they were like vivid blue and green and purple and pink. Um, and when I see these bright colors, that, that's exactly what I think of is these cold drinking glasses that were anodized aluminum. So that's how they add the, the, added the color during the anodization process. And you can see that it extends top right you can see the back where that color extends all the way around to the back i've had people tell me in the past that the buttons on the left that they thought that they were plastic but you can actually bend one of these if you try it hard enough so i can assure you they are not plastic okay so let's look at some other decorative finishes outside of the anodized finish uh, to the left here you have a division one button Again, not technically a medical, a metal button for competition purposes. This is a pearl button because it is a pearl background, but it has a lacquered finish that is made to look sort of like an imitation tortoise shell. Um, but you can really see the sharp edges here where they've cut it out. It's just a beautifully made button, um, kind of scarce. If you can get a hold, a hold of one of these in good shape, uh, you've got a real treasure. Here we have a spattered paint finish. It was on a kind of a utilitarian button. And I do happen to know that that one was produced by Atlas Tack. Here we have a tinted button and you can see where that tint is sort of starting to, to wear off on there. This is a very lightweight button too. It's kind of large, but it's light as air. Here we have a two piece button. This one um, has some tint in the background as well as some paint on the hearts. This one, I believe, does have a steel back. So again, if you try to use the magnet to test it, you know, it's going to stick to that steel back. But the front is aluminum, so technically that's an aluminum button. Here we have a couple of buttons. Both of them have that anodized finish, um, but they also have the addition of a cold plastic, in that cold plastic enamel. The one on the left has some glitter mixed into the cold plastic enamel. And then here we have a much older division one button, but I really like it. It's, it's because each, there's so many different little tints that have been applied to that. It's been sort of punched up from the reverse before they put that button together. It's really beautiful. Not mine, but I love it. All right, let's look at some other material embellishments. Okay, so first we've got a square one, square-ish button that has a holographic plastic film that's been applied to it. Here we have one that's got a little brass sort of knob or bead in the center. And it's interesting to see how they actually attached that. So it's kind of riveted through. You can see the back of the rivet here. And with that, they were able to attach what I would call like a pull tab shank. So they attached all that together through that rivet and then they pull up that to create the shank so it could be sewn on. Here we have one that has some black glass on it. Now, I, I know you're gonna look at that and say, that is no way aluminum. It is actually, it's on an original sales card that I'm gonna show you in just a minute. Um, but I actually did even remove it from the original sales card, which, is, which specifically says aluminum buttons. I looked at the back, I did a little scratch test, I tested it as light as air, and it is most certainly aluminum. 
you can already see though, so already the little black glass pieces are falling out. So probably not gonna use that in competition because it'll probably just fall apart, but uh, you don't see that very often. Same here. You do not find rhinestones very often on aluminum buttons, okay? Um, I don't know if they just, the, the glue didn't hold or they just didn't stay on well for whatever, or maybe because they were more flexible because they were very soft metal, I'm not sure, but you do not find them very often on aluminum. In the bottom, you've got a division one button that has a little tinted steel on the top and a little bit of chasing to it. All right, sometimes you can see where aluminum has been used on other buttons as sort of an embellishment. Here you have a celluloid button that has a little aluminum uh, piece in the center. Here we have a brass button with a little enamel plaquette and then there's a steel on top and then you've got that, that inner border of uh, aluminum. So it's a nice multi-component button. Um, I couldn't say with 100% certainty that that's aluminum, but I'd say given the color and the clarity and the style, I think it's, it's a pretty safe bet that it would be. This was a studio button. It was produced for, I believe, the Washington State Button Society as a favor button. It's a, a coconut button. And this one was made by Beth Schott and her sister, Maria Brandt. And they tinted, and very nicely tint, tinted that with some ink, I think. Uh, this button I purchased just recently. It's made by uh, glass artist Mary Gamond. And this one, it's a green glass button, technically, because the shank is in the green glass. There's a little wood stick, and then you've got the aluminum part that actually turns. So this is a mechanical button, movable button with a little brass bead in the center. And here, I'm not sure if this is the right place to put this, but I needed to use it somewhere because this is a very deluxe button. So this is a division one button. Uh, technically, it would be a pearl button because you have this whole pearl piece so it's pearl mounted in metal um, it has little florets here on the border that are crimped around little steel rivets and then the steel rivets were pushed through and that's how they were attached to the border but here you have a little escutcheon on the surface so um, it's just a very deluxe button and the way that's all attached is again this little center is crimped around a steel piece that goes down all the way through to the back and attaches that escutcheon to the pearl. Very beautiful, uh, not easy to find, but worth having, I think. Okay, now we're gonna look at some back types. First, this is one of the back of one of the hammered aluminum buttons that I showed you earlier. A lot of these will have a brass shank. Um, somehow they're, either, they're embedded somehow, swaged in, however they add them, but they're sort of embedded in there. This one was an interesting, sort of an anomaly that I found. This, this is indeed aluminum. It's just as light as air. It makes a nice little tink when you drop it on some wood. Um, and it's almost constructed like a cricket cage. So they've, it's all one piece and it's all been folded around to the back. So it's sort of hollow. Here we have a three hole. This is a modern button made by an artist. Here, this is a little two-piece button. I wanted to show you this simply because it's got the back mark on it, the Hong Kong back mark. And then the, the front is very plain um, anodized aluminum. This one, um, not my button, the picture was shared, but I think it's interesting uh, because of the way they were able to wedge this sort of loop into this little um, back sort of hump where they've pushed that together to hold that loop on there. And this is sort of a similar idea. You've got sort of a little pinched cone here on the back and that's holding in place a rather thick uh, piece of aluminum wire loop. There are also pin shanks. This is a button I showed you on one of my first slides. This is uh, a very thin piece of division. It's a division one aluminum button. It's a very thin piece of aluminum. And it's so thin and so light, it almost reminds me like of a communion wafer. It is just so thin, like wafer thin. Um, but anyway, you can see that it's got a pin shank attached to this little uh, cut steel bead in the center. And here's another one. I love the way they've formed the aluminum into these petals. So they've created all these little petals and the way it's held together is there is a rhinestone set in like a little tiny brass cup and that goes through with a wire to the back and that's looped around to create the shank. All right, let's look at different ways you can use this in competition. Um, again, I told you there are very few, very rare diminutives, but they are out there. 
Here we have a, a usage button, which is one of the pants buttons. This one was made by Atlas Tech. And interestingly enough, if you do collect the trouser buttons or pant buttons, this one would be considered a realistic. So it's kind of cool. And then we have another usage button, which would be a commemorative button. This one is from in 1969, the first moon landing. Here we have pierced. Uh, there are open work aluminum buttons, not quite as common as the solid body ones, but um, there are um, open work examples and pierced examples that you can find. Here we have Raggedy Ann and Andy, which are kind of cute. Those would be a related pair, not matching pair, but related pair. So they could be used in that category. Here we have a movable button. This little Santa moon face has a little brass star that dangles. And here I have uh, an original card made in Japan that has a set of flags. Um, and technically, I guess these could be considered as a set, although I don't, it's not an official NBS set. It is uh, at least, I think, a set in my mind. You can find basically for any tray that you're working on, any assorted material tray, you can pretty much find an aluminum button, any subject matter you want. You've got animals, objects, plant life, patterns, you name it. It's out there, you can probably find it. And these are just some examples. Okay, I'm not a uniform button collector, so my apologies to the uniform folks that are out there. I hope I got this right. Um, so a couple of those could be societies, I'm not sure, but anyway, I'm gonna call them uniform buttons for our purposes. And um, you can see, especially when you look at the back, the brightness and the clarity of that color. It's, they're, it's very, they're very, white and typically they, they show sort of a softness just from wear. Um, I think they're less commonly used for uniform buttons because they are a, it is a soft metal. Um, so maybe you don't find them as much as you would other other white metals in that particular type. Uh, now Campfire Girl, Girls, I do know that that is a button and even though that is an exceptional shape, I do know that that is an aluminum button. I have checked it. So that's a really cute one in excellent condition. Um, this one, I'm going to assume is, is a uniform button. I know that's sort of a, a Czech railway, like for the trolley system, those are some uniform buttons. Um, and I know there are glass ones that are made with the same design. So I'm going to assume uniform button, although it's Czech and I couldn't be 100% sure, but it is aluminum, so it's an option. I want to give you a pointer here. Um, if, because a lot of uniform buttons were made in different white metal finishes, they could be, uh, chrome plated, they could be nickel plated, they could be silver plated, and they're all going to look, hey, I think this looks like aluminum, it must be aluminum. The best way to do it is by comparison. And I can't share this image with you because I don't own the image, but it is out there. And if you want to make yourself a little note, you can go Google this. And if you Google image search these words, antique Scoville salesman sample button card, then you're going to be able to find a sales sample button card that's out there that shows some of the Scoville buttons that were made in the various finishes. And when you see the various white metal finishes that are on there, you'll be able to very quickly see the difference between the aluminum and the chrome plated or the nickel plated or the silver plated. So I can't show you that image, but you can go out there on your own and do a little digging and you can find it yourselves. Countries and manufacturer. Um, I've already shown you one car that was made in Japan. The hammered ones were made in the States. Um, they were probably made any number of places. Uh, the button card on the left um, was made in Hong Kong. And then the button card over here on the right was made in West Germany. And probably most sales sample cards that I have come across um, outside of JHB were made in West Germany. And if you follow my cursor up here, up here in the top center, you can see the one with the little black glass bits on it and where it came from. Okay, so, oh, and also the JHB ones, a lot of those were made in either Japan or Korea. A lot of the original cards I've seen from there say made in Korea, so. So let's look, let's just do a little recap here. If you're trying to determine if your button is aluminum, just sort of ask yourself some questions. You're sort of doing it by, you're deducing, is it or is it something else? So you're looking at things like, is it bright? Is it uniformly white and bright? Now that doesn't include buttons that would have a tent or an anodized finish, but, but underneath there, is that a bright white 
with no other color, no hint of yellow on the outside edges or the raised points. That's what you're looking for. Does it attract to a magnet? Okay, we talked about how, you know, if, if it's a magnet and it's going sticking right to it, you probably have steel. Is it light as air? They are exceptionally light. They could be the same weight as a plastic button, um, with the exception, again, of those cast buttons, which are heavier. But most of them are going to be exceptionally light. Does it have any rust or does it have any tarnish on it? Again, you're not going to find that. Um, outside of the little bit of occasional little bit of white oxidization, you're just not going to find you're not going to find that. It's going to maintain that color and that clarity. Is the shank soldered? Again, as I said before, uh, you're just not going to find that. If you could, you could in a very rare occasion find that, but it would be a mystery as, as to how they did that. Um, is it cold? Remember, I told you about on the plastic. If it's if it's put it on your cheek, is it going to be colder or is it room temperature? If it's cold, then you're looking more likely at metal than plastic. And then the next one is just have you basically gone through the process of ruling out any other similar types of metal? And I have one more comparison here to show you for that, which is this. Okay, on the right, you're going to see some Art Deco style buttons that are a white metal. Those are chrome plated buttons, okay? Um, but I'm gonna show you from roughly around the same time period, here are the aluminum buttons. These also have kind of an Art Deco style to them and those are solid aluminum buttons. So again, you're always just looking and sort of weeding out the other metals before you decide if that, if that button is actually aluminum. And I'm gonna leave you, my final image is of a very deluxe button, not mine, um, but it's exceptionally deluxe button. It's a large button, um, looks like some engine turning or engraving in the background, and then it's got a brass escutcheon, which holds some little pieces of green glass. And you can see over to the right how clever they were and how they held it all together. Again, they had some little brass rivets that went through and attached in the back to a plate and a loop shank. So there are very deluxe and beautiful buttons in aluminum out there as well as some very common ones. So you can pretty much find aluminum buttons in any price range that you want. So with that, I will leave you with credits and references. I want to thank everybody who let me borrow their images so that I could add to this presentation and to Jocelyn Howells and Best Shop for some additional um, support and additional information. So that's that. We'll see.